Hey everyone, welcome back for another deep dive. Today we're really challenging assumptions looking at how we define and categorize natural resources and whether our current consumption habits are actually sustainable. And get this, our source material is a textbook. Oh, sounds thrilling. Well, before you fall asleep, it's actually really interesting. It's a high school geography textbook called Making Connections. We're diving into chapter four, which is all about rethinking resource use. Mm -hmm. And you know what I love about textbooks? They're designed to spark curiosity, get those young minds thinking critically, so we get to tap into that fresh perspective. I'm all for that. And speaking of perspectives, the textbook starts with a quote by Eric Zimmerman, a pretty famous geographer. He said, resources are not, they become. Okay, so what's that supposed to mean? It means what we consider a resource, what's valuable to us, it's not fixed. It's defined by what we need as humans and what we have the technology to use. So something can go from being like totally useless to incredibly valuable just because our needs and know-how change. You got it. And the textbook uses a really interesting example, flint. Flint. Like the stuff people used to make sparks in cartoons? Exactly. It sounds almost funny now, right? Well, yeah. Who even thinks about flint anymore? But that's the point. For early humans, flint was cutting edge technology, literally. The ability to make fire, create sharp tools, that was revolutionary. It was a matter of survival. Wow, I never thought of it like that. But then technology advanced and flint's importance. You faded away. Yeah, just like that. And it makes you wonder, what about oil? Ooh, good point. We're so dependent on it now. Right, but for how long? Just like flint was essential for early humans, Oil has been the lifeblood of modern society. But things are changing. We're moving towards renewable energy. So what happens to oil then? Does it become like Flint, just a relic of the past? That's the million dollar question. The textbook actually has this cool chart, figure 4-3, I think it is, that shows how the importance of different resources has shifted over time. So if oil's reign is ending, what takes its place? What will be the Flint of the future? Hmm. Those are some big questions. Maybe we need to discover some new element or something. Well, who knows? Maybe it's already here, just not on our radar yet. Like lithium for batteries or rare earth elements used in all our electronics. True. Okay, so the textbook talks about these different categories of resources. Mm -hmm. Renewable, non-renewable flow resources. Oh, and then there's this category called other. Yeah, like they even list the northern lights as a resource. Okay, that's a new one. What's the logic there? Right. It's like they're saying, hey, think outside the box. They're talking about the cultural value, the awe-inspiring beauty of the Northern Lights. It's not something we typically think of as a resource, but it has worth, you know? That's a really interesting point. I mean, we're so used to thinking of resources in terms of what we can extract and consume, but there's so much more to it than that. Exactly. It's like, what about the things that enrich our lives, inspire us, connect us to something bigger than ourselves? Those are valuable too, right? Absolutely. But even when we're talking about more traditional resources, like the textbook makes it clear that just because something is renewable doesn't mean we can use as much as we want without consequences. Right. Like trees. You need to plant new ones or else. Exactly. Or fish. They can replenish themselves. But if we take them out of the ocean faster than they can reproduce, well, that's not so sustainable, is it? Nope. We really need to find that balance. Definitely. And speaking of balance, the textbook talks about this hierarchy when it comes to resource management. You know, reduce, reuse, recycle. Oh, yeah. The three R's. I'm a recycling pro. Well, that's great. But recycling is actually further down the list. Reduce comes first. Really? See, I always thought recycling was like the gold standard. It's important. Don't get me wrong. But reducing our consumption in the first place, that's where the real impact is. Huh. Okay. So... Less is more, I guess. You could say that. It's about being more mindful of what we buy, choosing durable products, repairing things instead of automatically replacing them, you know, shifting our mindset from disposable to more, appreciative of the things we own. Makes sense. Like fast fashion, right? Always buying new clothes. Yeah. Just because they're trendy. Exactly. And then those clothes end up in a landfill a few months later. Not exactly sustainable. Okay, so maybe I need to rethink my shopping habits a bit. But what about reusing stuff? What does that look like in practice? Yeah, there are so many creative ways to give things a second life. The tent book actually has some cool examples. Like, remember those bins for empty beer bottles you see oh, everywhere? The beer store. Oh. So those are actually about reusing bottles, not just recycling. You got it. They mm -hmm. collect the empties, sterilize them, and use them again. Way better than just melting them down, right? Right. I read that somewhere in the textbook. They said it's like climbing a ladder. Exactly. The waste hierarchy. Reducing is at the top. 
because it has the lowest environmental impact overall. Then comes reusing and finally recycling at the bottom rung. So the beer bottles were like one step up from just tossing them in the recycling bin. Exactly. And the textbook mentioned another example, something about soft drink bottles in Ontario. Oh, yeah. It was kind of shocking. <laughs> it said that back in the day, we used to have a deposit return system for those big glass bottles. Like you'd bring your empties back to the store, get some money back. Sounds pretty smart to me. I know, right? But then we switched to those single-use plastic bottles. And went down a rung on the ladder. Exactly. Kind of makes you wonder, what were we thinking? Well, things aren't always so straightforward. Like, even recycling, it's not without its costs, right? You gotta collect all those materials, transport them, process them. It all takes energy, resources. True. So it's not like recycling is a magic solution. Nope. Not a free pass. That's why reducing comes first. And then there's this thing called waste diversion. Basically, it's about keeping stuff out of the landfill in the first place like composting food scraps instead of chucking them in the trash, or donating old electronics instead of letting them gather dust in the basement. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So reduce, reuse, recycle, and now we're adding divert to the mix. My brain is full. But you know, it's kind of funny. I used to feel so smug about my blue box, all neatly sorted. Now I'm like, wait a minute, what about all the other stuff? The stuff I don't even think about. It's a process. We're all learning as we go. But you know, the cool thing is, there are so many people out there already doing amazing things. Like, the textbook mentioned used clothing stores. People are totally into vintage and secondhand these days. It's trendy. Yeah. And it's way better for the environment than buying brand new all the time. Totally. And there are online marketplaces now where you can buy and sell used stuff. Like, Furniture, clothes, electronics, you name it. Yeah, I've gotten some great deals that way. It's Eve. It's a win-win. Good for your wallet, good for the planet. Yeah. It's all about changing our mindset. Like, do we really need to buy everything brand new? Okay, that's my weakness. I'll admit I'm a sucker for the latest gadgets. New phone, new game console. Gotta have it. Well, you're not alone, right? That's how our consumer culture works. It's designed to make us feel like we always need the newest, shiniest thing. True. But maybe it's time to rethink that, right? to ask ourselves, do I really need this? Exactly. Like, the textbook had this really interesting example about towels in hotels. Oh, yeah. It was saying how some hotels have that little sign in the bathroom asking guests to reuse their towels. And it actually works. Yeah, it's amazing how such a simple thing can make a difference. If everyone just reused their towel once, it would save a ton of water and energy. It's like that saying, many hands make light work. Or in this case, many reused towels make a lighter environmental footprint. But it makes you wonder, if something as small as reusing a towel can have an impact, what about all the other choices we make every day? Exactly. Like using a refillable water bottle instead of buying plastic ones. Or choosing products with less packaging. Or biking to work instead of driving. It all adds up, right? Totally. And the more we do it, the more normal it becomes. So true. But, but okay, let's be real. It's not all on us as individuals, right? What about the big players, the companies and governments? They have a role to play too, don't they? Absolutely. And in the next part of our deep dive, we'll unpack their responsibilities and explore what they're doing to shift us towards a more sustainable future. It's a two-way street for sure. Companies respond to what consumers want, right? But governments, they can set the rules of the game. Right. They can nudge things in the right direction with policies and regulations and stuff. Exactly. And the textbook actually uses a really good example, something about fuel economy standards in the U.S. Oh, yeah. I remember reading that. So basically, the government said, hey, car companies, you need to make your cars more fuel efficient. Yep. They set these increasingly strict targets that the automakers had to meet. And how did that go over? Well, not everyone was thrilled about it, obviously. There was some pushback from the industry. And it took time, you know? Technology doesn't change overnight. But it did change. They figured it out. They did. And now we have cars that use way less gas, which is good for the environment, good for consumers. Win-win. See, that's what I love about government regulation. When it works, it really works. For sure. But it's a balancing act, right? Right. Governments have to weigh environmental concerns with economic realities. Yeah, it's not always easy to find that sweet spot. But hey, speaking of doing good while doing well, there are some companies out there that are really stepping up, being above and beyond what's required. Like, they're making sustainability part of their brand. Absolutely. More and more companies are realizing that being environmentally responsible is actually good for business. Yeah, consumers getting savvier, too. We care about where our products come from, how they're made. It's like people are voting with their wallets, right. supporting companies that align with their values. Totally. 
but it can be hard to tell sometimes, you know, like, are they actually committed to sustainability or is it just a marketing ploy? Greenwashing, as they call it. Right. Got to be able to see through that. But I think the textbook gives some good advice, like look for transparency. Do companies actually share information about their supply chains, their environmental practices? Yeah. Are they walking the talk, yeah. basically? Not just talking a big game. Exactly. And look for measurable goals. Are they tracking their progress? Are they getting third-party certifications? That kind of thing. So do your research, basically. Don't just take their word for it. Okay, so we've talked about individual actions, government policies, corporate responsibility. It feels like a lot. Is it enough? Like, are we actually going to create this circular economy where resources are valued and used sustainably? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? I don't think anyone has all the answers, but you know, the fact that we're having these conversations that people are demanding change, that's a good sign. It's like we're finally waking up to the reality that we can't just keep taking and consuming without consequences. Exactly. And the textbook, even though it's written for high schoolers, it really gets at the heart of the issue. It's not just about finding new technologies or passing stricter laws. It's about a fundamental shift in mindset. Like rethinking our relationship with the planet seeing ourselves as part of nature, not separate from it. Absolutely, and that's a big ask, but you know, I'm an optimist. I think we're capable of amazing things when we work together towards a common goal. I love that energy. So as we wrap up this deep dive, what's the one thing you want our listeners to take away from all of this? Don't underestimate the power of your choices. Every little action you take, every product you buy, every conversation you have, it all ripples out and has an impact. So true. We're not powerless in the face of these big, complex challenges. Not at all. We have agency. We have a voice. And together, we can create a more sustainable, equitable future. I love that message. On that note, a huge thank you to our expert for joining us on this deep dive. And to our listeners, thank you for being here for engaging with these important issues, and for being part of the solution. Remember, knowledge is power, and together we can make a difference. Until next time, keep asking those tough questions, keep learning, and keep diving deep.